Today I'd like to share some thoughts on housing um, and some housing alternatives and speak a little bit about the housing crisis that we face in the United States. Uh, I'd like to share some thoughts from <coughs> Fran Quigley. Fran is a uh, lawyer who directs the Health and Human Rights Clinic uh, at the University Robert H. McKinney School of Law at Indiana University. So uh, Fran is a practitioner. Uh, he knows the field. Uh, he actually directs his students uh, and himself, of course, to work with people that are facing eviction. So uh, he, he knows the system. He knows how to deal with the system. He, he knows what can work uh, and what direction we should move in. So these are just some thoughts about that, that to, to share with you uh, in terms of what we can do to improve housing in our country, and a little bit about the scope of the problem as well. Uh, homelessness, uh, believe it or not, affects 600,000 Americans each year. So it's not really <coughs> a minor problem. It's, it's a huge problem in our country. So it's something that we have to address. Uh, and certainly we look at it from a social justice perspective. And Jesus tells us that uh, one of the signs of the kingdom, one of the signs of people that are following uh, Jesus, uh, following what he would desire and, and finding Jesus in other people, is uh, finding Jesus in those that are homeless and helping those that are homeless to find a home, as well as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. Sheltering the homeless is one of the uh, traditional Catholic works of mercy. So it's important that we can reflect on it and see what we can do with regard to that. In the United States, 44 million households rent. So rent uh, is, is a big part of the picture too, not just people that are buying homes, uh, which is, a, is an important issue, but, but really facing the rental situation. Uh, in the year 2021, Fran notes that rents increased by almost 20%. So can you imagine uh, facing that situation where your rent is increasing so much? Uh, much higher, obviously, than the rate of inflation, uh, and much higher than any increase in your salary. So what are you going to do? Uh, you have to make some uh, compromises in your budget because how are you going to pay that rent? what is going to suffer in terms of your budget, what expenses can you eliminate. Uh, this is a challenge. This is something that's very difficult. So that's an issue that we have to address. We have to ask ourselves, is a 20% increase in rent in one year ever justified? Uh, it seems like an outrageous increase uh, to uh, have a rent go up that much. I, I can just imagine, you know, your paying so much per month, and the landlord says, well, you know, tack another 20% on top of that. Well, where am I going to get that money? And then if I don't get it, I face eviction uh, and all of the consequent problems with regard to eviction. 25 million people in the United States live in households where they are paying more than half their income in rent. So can you imagine, you know, paying more than half of the income that you, you get, paying that in rent? Uh, how are you going to afford that long term? I mean, obviously, that's not going to work for you in terms of any budget, uh, more than half of that going for rent. Now, the problem then becomes with regard to eviction. Uh, each time somebody is evicted, uh, and Fran, of course, works with those who are facing eviction. Uh, there is damage done. So eviction is not something that is something that we can just pass over. There's real damage done. Uh, there's damage done to the physical and mental health of the family. Uh, and particularly children are deeply affected by eviction. So eviction is something that obviously you want to avoid for a family. So what are some solutions with regard to the eviction crisis? Some of the solutions are to raise the cost of eviction filings. Uh, filings in our area are very uh, cheap. Uh, it only costs $125 or $150 in our area on Long Island 
to file for an eviction. So this makes filing really very easy because you know if you pay that fee, you evict somebody and you tack on that rent and obviously you're going to make that back maybe in the very first month of renting the apartment to somebody else. So there's no incentive not to file an eviction notice uh, and to raise rent. Uh, and as we have seen, 20% in one year is, is outrageous. Uh, research has shown that higher filing fees, even in low uh, income areas like Alabama, <clears throat> are associated with significantly lower eviction rates. So the research is clear. You raise the fees for the eviction filings, there's going to be less filing, and therefore less evictions and less homelessness. So it makes sense to follow that path and to make it a little bit more difficult for landlords than to evict people. And also, with that in mind, uh, less of an incentive to raise the rent on people because you're going to have to go through this longer process and more expensive process of eviction. You might as well keep the people here and keep the rent about the same or raise it maybe slightly. Uh, also, eviction rates are low in cities where landlords are required to show good cause before putting tenants out and refusing to renew their leases. So these so-called good cause laws are important because, again, they keep eviction rates low. And, and that's the idea that you want to pursue here with regard to homelessness. Keep the eviction rate low. Uh, housing first approach. Uh, has been adopted in many uh, cities and many countries. And what is the housing first approach? The housing first approach says social service works on getting housing first. And then other issues like mental health and substance abuse. So you're facing a client with mental health issues, with substance abuse. Well, get the housing first. Housing is the priority. Some of these issues then you can work on later. But the housing is the key piece in all of this. Uh, this interrupts, if they, if you have housing, this interrupts the common path from homelessness to arrest and then to incar incarceration. So people that are homeless, certainly more likely to get arrested, more likely to get incarcerated. Uh, and, and you see, again, the cost factor involved here. It literally doesn't make any sense because What's going to happen is who's going to pick up the cost for the arrest? Who's going to pick up the cost for the incarceration? Uh, what <coughs> negative effects will that incarceration have on that person in terms of you know, their potential future, in terms of getting housing and help? So uh, in every way, it, you want to work to eliminate the, the cycle of eviction, uh, homelessness, arrest, incarceration. So the Housing First programs have achieved that objective. Get the house, and then you can deal with the other issues the person has, but do the housing first. Make that the priority. Another uh, aspect that works <clears throat> to help in the housing situation is rent control. Rent control protects renters from losing their homes when a so-called rent shock occurs. So you have your residence, it's controlled by the rent, you, it's going to go up a certain percentage, but not this high extent. Uh, and so you stay in your residence, which forces all to the good for, for the people. Uh, another thing that has to be worked on is zoning regulations, uh, limiting neighborhoods to single-family homes with large lot sizes and parking restrictions. Uh, Low-income families then were effectively barred from these communities. Uh, Matthew Desmond, the sociologist who has written extensively on poverty in America, says this is our polite, acquired means of promoting segregation. So how do we want to keep segregation in place? Let's work on our zoning laws. Uh, let's make these homes basically unaffordable for people that are struggling at the lower end of the income spectrum. Uh, and, you know, shuttle them to certain areas. Uh, so segregation, de facto segregation, not de jure segregation, de facto segregation, 
then prevails in that area because of the zoning regulation. So this is another thing you have to look at is, are the zoning regulations fair for everyone, give everyone an opportunity uh, to move in or restricting it because of the lot size, uh, because of certain restrictions in terms of parking, uh, those types of, of things. Uh, Santa Fe and New Mexico has worked on what they call inclusionary zoning rules. Uh, developers must set aside a share of new homes for rent or purchase by people of low or moderate income. The Santa Fe Homes Program has been very successful. Home buyers who earn below 100% of the area median income and renters earning below 80% of the area median income uh, can uh, be eligible for affordable housing. <laughs> Affordable housing is defined as paying no more than 30% of your monthly income to cover your housing costs. As we've seen through Fran's research, uh, there are those who, a significant number, who are paying over 50% of their income, uh, whereas the guideline stated should be about 30%. So affordable housing works on that percentage uh, and encourages people to uh, move into these homes uh, and encourages builders to to build these homes. And it has been a very successful program. It's a win-win uh, for them. Uh, and it's something that uh, we could adopt uh, in many areas, this inclusionary zoning to help with the housing situation. Uh, builders want to build or expand in certain areas or uh, modify uh, homes, all of, all of these concepts, and, and to make it affordable for people, very important. Uh, another uh, way to uh, address the housing crisis is through the public housing alternatives uh, for people with low income and people with disabilities. Again, another very important way to allow public housing because there are people who just are very limited in terms of their income or people with disabilities who cannot uh, uh, earn as much because they're, they're limited by their disability. So these are ways that we can expand through public housing and, and give people a good place to live, a safe place to live. Other income supports can also be very helpful in addressing housing. Uh, child tax credits are extremely helpful uh, in terms of really giving people more opportunity to uh, live a, a decent life. More robust food vouchers help with people in, in terms of getting adequate food and then of course spending less of that money uh, so they can uh, afford uh, rent and, and not become homeless and then occasional stimulus checks can help as well all of these are, are programs that have been proven effective so if we are serious the, the point i think that fran is making is if we are serious about the housing situation there are ways effective ways ways that work to address it. It's not a question where we don't have solutions, a question where we have not pursued those solutions for various reasons. Uh, and a lot of it could be the education, we just don't have the knowledge of this. Uh, and then it could be we don't have the will to do it, we just accept homelessness. Uh, and certainly that is not a good thing. It's something that we have to work to uh, overcome the problem of homelessness. We also see that there is a problem with the courts many times. They operate as collection and displacement factories for the benefit of corporate la uh, landlords. Uh, so these corporate landlords who own quite extensively in terms of properties and, and rental properties in particular, uh, the, the courts kind of reinforce this, that uh, you know, they can raise their rents, uh, evict people rather easily, uh, make more money, uh, but you know, you're creating a problem. And of course, you're reinforcing a social problem because then who is going to pay for sheltering people temporarily? Uh, again, the cost is gonna be on the taxpayer. So the landlord, is making money uh, and the taxpayer is really subsidizing what the landlord is doing here in terms of 
taking the people that are evicted uh, and trying to find housing for them. Uh, so again, this is a uh, an issue that's going to be addressed at the root cause, and, and of course, uh, it does affect all of us uh, who are paying higher taxes. And homelessness then becomes criminalized, so people are without homes and they become incarcerated, uh, they become arrested, you know, and, and the cycle kind of continues for them, uh, and they, they face all sorts of difficulties in terms of getting jobs, getting housing eventually, they've been criminalized. It's a, a terrible cycle. Private equity firms make billions of dollars in profits on rental housing. So here you have these firms that are raking in billions of dollars and people are homeless and the, the taxpayer is paying for this homelessness. Uh, so, so we have to take a look at this picture and say something is wrong with this picture. This is not working. This is not what we want. Uh, we want a, a fairer system. It's not that we don't want people to make a profit. Certainly people need to make a profit, but if you are making billions of dollars in profit and people are homeless, uh, isn't there something wrong with that picture? I mean, that, that's really out of whack. I mean, we, we, you want people to make certainly a certain modicum of profit. That's our system. But to make so much profit and to, in the wake of that profit, to cause this problem, homelessness is not uh, is not a good thing. And and Fran has seen this in his research. He's dealt with it uh, on practical basis with clients coming to his clinic, so he knows of what he speaks. Um, the NIMBY forces, not in my backyard, forces are very real. They are well funded, and they perpetuate housing segregation. They make people afraid. Well. You know, don't put it near me. Put it over here. Put it over there. Put it in this neighborhood. Um, we don't want. We don't want it. It's going to destroy our quality of life. Uh, and what, of course, you want something that's reasonable. Uh, you don't want to overwhelm a certain area. That's not. That's not fair. Uh, but you want something that is going to benefit the entire community. And if people are homeless, uh, this is not a good thing. Ultimately, for any community. That's an issue you want to address because you want to build up community, you want to build up people's lives, and particularly the children. You want to give them a good, solid future. Uh, you want to give them a good place to live, good food, good nutrition, good education. This is our future, uh, and we have to work towards that. Uh, good cause protection for renters was recently rebuffed in New York. So again, there are very strong political forces that are working against this, to say that, well, we can't have this because it's going to destroy our quality of life and, and also it's against our system. Uh, we need to make more profit on this uh, because you know, this is the way our system works. So we will increase the rent uh, and if people can't afford it, then they're out on the street. The tenant movement is working uh, against this. And People's Action Home Guarantee uh, is one of the strong uh, forces in, this, in the tenant movement. They're demanding a tenant's bill of rights that includes good cause guarantees and federal action on rent control. So this is something that uh, is really a strong movement and it's a movement by the tenants themselves who have had to deal with this situation. Uh, many of us, of course, are simply unaware of this situation. We don't deal in rent. We deal. We have our homes, and we're not dealing with this, with these types of uh, issues that affect so many people, so many of our fellow citizens. What are the tactics of the home guarantee uh, movement? They canvass, they occupy vacant buildings, and they push ballot initiatives. They've had wins with the strategy in Kansas City, in Portland, Maine, and in the entire state of Colorado. Ballot measures to mandate rent control and fund more affordable housing won, often by comfortable uh, uh, margins. So when these measures are put forward, they do have the support of the people. I think most people want to see a fair and equitable system on housing. They don't want to see people evicted. Uh, they want to help people and help people to stay in their homes uh, and make rent certainly reasonable. Uh, you, you want a 
certain profit for the landlord. That goes without saying, but you also want to make it reasonable for the person who is renting. Uh, raising a rent 20% in one year is certainly uh, not reasonable. The National Low Income Housing Coalition uh, has a campaign called the Housed Campaign, and their objective is to expand rental assistance to every eligible household and to create a national housing stabilization fund to provide emergency help when people have emergencies due to illness or other situations. This movement has been joined by Catholic Charities USA, the Union for Reform Judaism, and the national leadership of the Episcopal and Methodist churches. So it has uh, a good religious backing uh, because many of the religious groups uh, want to work together to eliminate this problem of homelessness. Uh, President Biden, on pressure from the attendance group, has come up with a blueprint for a renter's bill of rights. Uh, which again would be something similar here that the renter is protected. And really, I think it comes down to a simple concept. Housing is a human right. Uh, everyone deserves uh, to have a home. And naturally, we all want to work for that. that everyone has a good place to live, uh, a place to raise their children in, in peace, uh, and, and a place where they can thrive as human beings, as sons and daughters of God.